Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5TUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 466 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. And tonight we bring you our short topics episode. So thanks for being here for that. We're glad you're tuned in, whether you're live or whether you're listening after the fact. We appreciate everybody who downloads the show and listens, and we particularly like it when you share with somebody who may not know about us. So if you have not shared, please do so. Word of mouth is a great advertising technique. So we need to get into our short topics, but of course, before we do that, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. All right. So yeah, we're we're starting to get into the groove of our new schedule. We had our deep dive last time. We have our short topics this time. And next week, of course, we'll be recording our weekender, which will actually be kind of nice because it'll wind up being the last thing we do before we head off to Hamvention, so we'll, we'll have a little bit of fun, talk about the upcoming show, and then we'll hope to see everybody out at Hamvention in less than two weeks' time. Wow, it's incredible. Yep. Seems like it was only three years ago. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. But anyway, we'll talk more about that as the show goes on and, and the next show as well, too. But let's go ahead and get into it. Let's do our amateur radio segment for tonight. Jump into our first topic, and we'll go ahead and let Cheryl go ahead and read our first amateur radio topic for tonight. Okay, our first topic is ARRL Club Grant Programs Now Accepting Applications. And the story reads, the ARRL has long recognized that it is in the best interest of amateur radio to encourage and support amateur radio clubs. Clubs historically have recruited, licensed, and trained new radio amateurs and have provided the community setting for radio amateurs to continue their education and training. The ARRL Foundation Club Program, funded by a grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, otherwise known as ARDC, will make $500,000 available to clubs, enabling them to more easily provide and expand these important services. The program will provide up to $25,000 for worthy club projects, while requests for more than that will be referred back to ARDC. So the grant program at a glance is... Clubs do not need to be ARRL affiliated clubs to submit proposals. Looking to, fo- uh, looking to fund projects that create significant impact beyond the applying club. Uh, transformative impact on amateur radio. Create public awareness and support for amateur radio, education, and training. Uh, examples of the projects include, but are not limited to, get on the air projects, HAM training and skills development through mentoring, STEM and STEAM learning through amateur radio, station resources for use by the HAM community, emergency communications and public service projects that emphasize training, and club revitalization projects. And grant funds may not be used for commercial or for-profit projects. And this information came from uh, the ARRL and KB6NU. Dan yeah, is... I found the uh, the post from Dan, <laughs> and then I uh, used the text from ARRL just gotcha. to confuse things. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, of course, is with the ARDC, and he works on these grants, so that's why we know about all these things. It's not, of course, they're published everywhere, so it's not really that <laughs> hard to find the information. But all right, looks like uh, lots of clubs will be applying for some. Uh, a double or some Ardsa, Ardka, Ardka. Is that what we're going to go with? Ardka money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. And and there, oh, I should mention that if I'm pretty sure we mentioned this before, but ARDC will, of course, be at Hamvention. And you can talk to the guys from ARDC while you're up there if you have 
questions or thoughts about the grant program or anything else that ARDC does, so visit them too, but visit us first. <laughs> All right. Next story is need another reason to go to Hamvention. Hmm. There's an awful lot of talk of Hamvention. Crazy. One lucky attendee at Dayton Hamvention 2022, which is from May 20th through the 22nd, will walk away with the largest prize ever offered in the history of the event, an ICOM Amateur Radio Dream Station package worth close to 20 thousand u.s dollars Ooh. guess i should get a ticket <laughs> the prize package which includes an icom ic7851 hf and 50 megahertz transceiver and a long list of station accessories was donated by dx engineering in conjunction with icom america platinum prize sponsors for hamvention 2022 view the entire contents of the prize package at dx engineering's website read complete contest rules here i guess here because we're going to read On them the right website <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're quoting now from somebody, uh, Rick Elnut, WS8G. On behalf of the many hams who work so hard to make Hamvention a truly special event, let me offer my most heartfelt gratitude to DX Engineering and ICOM America for their Platinum Prize sponsorship. Hamvention, uh, sorry, he's the Hamvention General Chairman, by the way, WS8G. We simply can't give enough thanks to all of our generous sponsors. The Dream Station Prize adds even more excitement to what promises to be an amazing three days in Dayton. Hamvention is one of the signature events of the Ham Radio calendar, and it's something our team of active operators look forward to every year. Yeah, and since we haven't had it for the last two, hopefully that means everybody's going to come out of the woodwork. Uh, this, this part of the quote is by Tim Duffy, by the way, K3LR. He's the DX Engineering Chief Executive Officer. Being a Platinum Prize sponsor along with ICOM America is our way of giving back to the amateur radio community who has supported us for more than two decades. Can't wait to see everyone in Dayton to talk about the world's greatest hobby. End quote. So for full details about Dayton Hamvention 2022, visit the event's official website, which is hamvention.org. And, of course, a link to all the goodies and stuff will be in the show notes. So come to Dayton, win stuff, and talk to us. Those are the best things to do. And eat crappy food and try and find some place to go to the bathroom that isn't flooded. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. They didn't have how, flooding this last at the new event, right? You know, it, the funny thing is, even if it's not raining, there seems to be a flood in the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Luckily, the ladies' bathroom isn't that way, unlike Hera. Yeah. Well, <laughs> apparently, well, we all know the guys can't aim. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, let's go ahead and move on. We don't need to get into that. I'm sure we'll be talking about it after the show. Uh, let's bring Bill in here, who is hopefully in sync now, uh, to cover this third story okay. in our amateur radio topics. Test one, two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think you may <laughs> still be still. Del- still a little delayed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Something's goofy with the network here. But anyway, I will. I will read this, and all the synchronization will occur in post. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, this is uh, thinking ahead. Uh, changing your habits for personal privacy and anonymity as an amateur radio operator. And this is a blog post by uh, Steve K9ZW on his blog called uh, With Variant Frequency Blog. And he says, uh, one should always remember that as a ham, you are already, quote, on a list, end quote, in an official sense. It is that list that records your call sign. But there's times when it's useful to have more personal privacy and perhaps a bit of anonymity. And he goes on to point there's three different areas in which uh, you can you can focus on this. Your physical address, which you can obscure be, by you know using a P.O. box or a work address. Well, probably not a work address because that would still point back to you, right? <laughs> or some other uh, address on your a ULS uh, listing and stuff like that. Uh, personal privacy, uh, you know, this would be kind of like uh, not using your call sign. It's posted all over your car or on your license plate. A lot of people get amateur radio plates. I mean, obviously, if you have your call sign on your plate and your home address on your uh, on your ULS and uh, QRZ.com page, uh, you know, you're obviously very uh, exposed in, uh, in in that type of realm where your personal privacy is uh, not no longer uh, no longer private as you, uh, you know, demonstrate your driving skills around on the road. And of course, anonymity as the third item he points to, and that's kind of like uh, you know, not 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 wearing uh, you know, ham radio gear shirts or you know, pokey antennas off the cars and stuff like that. 
Uh, all in the maintaining of personal privacy and anonymity as an amateur radio operator is challenging and by definition can never be a hundred percent, but you do not have to be totally revealed either. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting, uh, interesting blog post. So I, uh, I suggest you, uh, head over there and, and read it yourself. And, uh, if you, uh, if you have a worry about your privacy and whatnot everywhere else, except for amateur radio, then, uh, you know, it might, might interest you if, uh, if, uh, you haven't quite covered those bases yet. The only way we're going to get anonymity here is if we move because our, our, our address and who we are and where we are is posted pretty much everywhere on the internet. So, uh, in, inside the world of amateur radio and outside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if someone's looking to find me, they're going to find me. But so <laughs> you want to try and fix your, your lagginess or just push ahead? Yes. I will do it one more time. Okay. One more time here. Stop. Exit. Server. Dis- Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I think we're good right now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't hiccup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, so let's plow ahead. <laughs> all right, so moving on, we are going to dive into the world of open source, and then later on we're going to talk about open source in the world of amateur radio, which we always do for our third and sometimes fourth segment if we ever had a lead topic, <laughs> which we rarely do. So let's start with open source. Our first topic tonight is Pop OS. We're hearing a lot about Pop OS, but I think we're going to be hearing a lot about different distributions that are based on Ubuntu because, of course, 2204 has been released. So everything that's based on it's going to be updating. And Pop OS is no exception. Now that those bunny eggs have been painted and the what the... A, a fico man? No idea. The Afi- the fico man has been found. Okay, I'm going to take that for what it is. It's the time to upgrade Pop OS. Pop exclamation point underscore OS exclamation point. Boy, it's just it's crazy. Here's what's new in Pop OS 2204 LTS. Automatic updates. Wow, it took till 2204 to get automatic updates. Okay. Uh, troubleshoot from the new support panel, dark versus light backgrounds, enhanced performance with the System76 scheduler, a new and improved pop shop, switch to pipe wire for audio processing, boo. The workspaces view has received a sizable tune-up. Installed NVIDIA drivers are now visible to pop shop and will no longer include an install button. Older drivers are also available to install, though the most recent available NVIDIA driver is recommended with most NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, sorry, GPUs. <laughs> uh, so now we've got Kapu. Better performance with the improvements to the Kapu scaling governor, which keeps your Kapu running at the optimal frequency for your system. <laughs> The Pop OS upgrade service will now only activate when I'm, I crack myself up. I activate when checking for or performing release upgrades. Previously, it was active 24 7. If your upgrade gets interrupted, Debian packages are now resumable, meaning you can pick up the upgrade from where you left off. That's nice. File type for icons has been changed to .svg, swig, or a scalable vector graphic for people who want the real thing. Max disk capacity for journal D logs is now limited to one gigabyte. That's nice. Added support for because I've had I've had a you know a disk partition fill up because of journal logs. So you don't want that happening. Added support for laptop privacy screens. Was that like polarizing or something? Or hmm, I guess. Oh, huh. interesting. I don't think I've ever had a laptop that had a privacy screen. Just, well, I've had ones that are de facto privacy screens because if you go out in the sunlight, you can't see them anyway. But, you know, there's that. So then there's Redup by default for remote desktop use or RDP. Better performance, scaling, and reliability in Pop Shop. And this funky new user icon, which you can't see here, but if you look at Pop OS, I'm sure you'll find it. So for foundational upkeep, it's based on Ubuntu 2204. Duh. <laughs> Linux, <laughs> <laughs> Linux kernel 5.16.19 was the kernel at release. All right, Bill, you're going to make it? Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> uh, it's got Misa 22 and uh, updated to GNOME 42 base with the System76 Cosmic UX. So All cosmic-y. right. Cosmic-y, yes. The cosmic <clears throat> ux. 
All right. So anyway, more on that. You can be found at the System76 blog site, which will be linked, of course, in the show notes. And uh, a, a note just popped up in the Etherpad. Uh, the Afika man is a substitute for the Passover sacrifice. Interesting. Which was the last thing eaten at the Passover meal. It still doesn't tell me what it is. I think it's like something. <laughs> it's, yeah, <laughs> it's I'm sure it's something. Bread or something like I that. I mean, there's a what name it? for it, so it's something. But yeah, it's it's a piece of matzo bread. I see. Why didn't they just see a piece of pizza matzo bread? <laughs> well, yeah, it's 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 part of the the old the old you know, um, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, it, my, you, you've my been brain, very helpful. Yeah, the, it's, it, it was used during the eras. I'm back to I'm back to Wikipedia during the first and second temples, and during the period of the tabernacle. The Talmud states it's forbidden to have any other food after the afikumen. Uh, so the taste of the matzah that was eaten after the meal remains in the participants' mouths. Now apparently, they hide this piece of the bread uh, or cracker and basically let the kids go find it. So it's like, you know, under something taped to the bottom of a chair, something so, like so that. So is this where the whole Easter thing came from? Is that, is that what the bunny represents uh, and the eggs? Is it? No, that that's pagan. That doesn't have everything to do with the Jewish community. No. So no, it all sounds the same to me. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. Uh, everybody's hey. ripping off everybody else. It's all yeah. plagiarism. So. <laughs> no, no. The 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 Easter Bunny is part of the uh, the spring celebration of birth and renewal through the pagan community. A fika men? So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, not that, but yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Fedora. Get away from Pop OS, and Bill's going to fill in the gaps on Fedora thirty six. Yeah, so Fedora 36 is still not released. However, uh, all the blockers for the release have currently been resolved. And now they're just uh, looking at uh, 15 uh, different build freeze exceptions. So this is what happens when they freeze the freeze the repo at the versions they're at. And they uh, just kind of go through and, and see if there's any, any showstoppers in there or things that uh, would prevent people from uh, being able to install and run things properly. I wish the wish Ubuntu would have done that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and most of the issues are uh, of the 15 are pretty much related with the GNOME. Uh, I saw a few contact issues, uh, a couple other little glitchy uh, graphical things, uh, an N NTLM issue and a VPN issue. So they look pretty mundane. Um, I'm currently running uh, the beta, and uh, yeah, be besides the whole network sync thing, which is is truly somewhere in my router upstairs <laughs> because it's only devices on the ethernet side of things that get messed up with the, the QOS, you know, whatever minimally enabled on the router. So, uh, but yeah, nothing to do with Fedora 36, but yeah, other than that, Fedora 36 is, is, is hopefully going to release. I would say probably the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'd probably say by this Friday, but uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see if that's actually going to happen. But uh, uh, at least all the blockers have been totally totally pulled out so so we're just onto these little nitpicky things that are uh that are kind of stalling the release but if you were wondering why fedora 36 is not fully released yet that that's why <laughs> and we uh, included links to the uh, blockers and the freeze exceptions in the show notes so you can check those out for yourself all right very good so at least one of us is looking forward to the release of fedora <laughs> 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 uh, I'm, I'm going to probably try it again here. I, I used to really like Fedora, you know, back in the days when it was Fedora Core, somewhere around Fedora Core 5, 6, 7, somewhere in there. Uh, I, I used it quite a bit. So, yeah, I really liked it back in the day, but I kind of switched back to Debian and Ubuntu and, and so on and so forth and kind of never really looked back. But, yeah, what are you going to do? All right, so moving on, let's get into some Linux in the ham shack, and we're going to talk about that latest version of Ubuntu 2204. We did a deep dive on it in the last episode, but we've been, uh, well, Bill and I, Bill mostly, but I have also been trying to build a custom version of 2204 for Linux in the ham shack. Bill's been doing the same, and we've uh, encountered some, some gotchas and things, so let's go ahead and do a little update on our deep dives. What do you got? Well, on my side, I've been uh, <clears throat> I've been trying to run it on real hardware, 
and uh, I have a spare XPS 13 uh, 9365 Dell, a uh, little laptop. And uh, I thought everything was great. I mean, I'd installed everything. I'd gotten, you know, all the ham radio, pure blend stuff going, CQR going, CQR log, and, and all the MariaDB fixes and, um, you know, in, installed SDR++ and SDR Angel. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I realized I had absolutely no sound in my system. And I went down a very, very deep and uh, bottomless hole <laughs> of suggestions and fixes to uh, bring back the audio into uh, the desktop environment, of which I was only seeing a dummy output device inside of uh, GNOME. Or, yeah, I guess, yeah, still call it for this. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, after changing the grub boot line, adding some more session stuff to Pipewire, and uh, uh, reinstalling uh, Pulse and the Pulse shim and everything else, and uh, I gave up. I uh, I uh, just, just whacked it this morning. <laughs> Now it's running Pop! OS and the sound runs great. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's where I'm at. I did start building the disk, but um, after I ran into personal issues and I started noticing that I wasn't the only one running into those issues, I kind of I just hammered the brakes on it because I'm like, I, I, you know, like I, I don't want someone to have the same problems I did. I mean, the strange, the weirdness I was seeing is, you know, I could see the device in also, but I couldn't see it couldn't see it in well the the ui couldn't see it at all so that's basically the pulse shim that that is exposed to the ui uh i mean i guess i could have tried uninstalling pulse and just get rid of pulse completely and try running everything directly with pipe wire but i think that's still uh um i don't know i i've never tried that and i i don't know what success i would have with that uh, but uh, I figure i thought well maybe it's just uh maybe I, all of a sudden my sound card exploded or something like that and uh um, someone else left a note about that. Was that uh, K, uh, K6? K6 GTE, yes. Yeah, Mike, K6 GTE left a note, and he said he had a similar problem, and it was because the uh, audio was jammed up to uh, to max, and uh, Pipewire choked on it. And uh, well, I uninstalled CW Daemon, uh, so it wasn't really that problem, and I went into uh, also Mixer and uh, lowered all the volume controls to, to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing nothing fixed it so um except for a, a clean install of uh pop os uh, 2204 lts how, how did you fare well apparently i'm i'm having that same issue with sound i have not tried to diagnose it yet or or go down that that deep rabbit hole to try and fix it it does seem to be i think we should specify associated with intel audio hardware because yes. your machine and my machine both use that. So that's also been a problem, and I haven't tried to fix it yet. I'm going to work on it, and I'm, and I'm doing a bare metal install as well on my Dale Inspiron with Intel-based audio hardware. And I just upgraded my Shack PC to 2204 from 2110. It's actually in the middle of the install. It's, it's waiting user input at the moment. So I'm going to see how much of that is broken once that update is done. But that is on an iMac. So we'll see how different that is. And I can't remember what the audio and video hardware on the iMac is. So... It may be different. It may be the same. I don't know. And then I had one really bizarre thing happen <laughs> on my Inspiron install. It, it started up fine. It, it booted fine, you know, minus the, the sound issue. But when I booted into Wayland, you know, the standard uh, X server, Wayland, it was fine. Except for the fact that I can't use Wayland because I use Barrier and Barrier doesn't support Wayland or vice versa, however you want to uh, consider that debate. <laughs> yeah, it's a I'm barrier say, issue. <laughs> yeah, it's a barrier issue, right. So, of course, I switched over to the Xorg backend, which booted fine a couple of times. And then the third time I would boot into it, and this is what was after two different fresh installs, by the way. So this wasn't an isolated incident. But after the second or third time of booting into the Xorg version of the desktop, my display would turn 
it would tint blue and everything was still sort of visible, but it was very bluish. And I don't mean like cool temperature. I mean, blue. Are you downloading the Smurf spin? (laughs) Apparently so. (laughs) didn't realize the, the Gargamel was in there, but, um, so what it turned out to be was it was setting a random color setting, a random color palette or color, whatever they call it, a color, uh, it's not a palette, but you know what I'm talking about. A yeah. color. <laughs> it was a monitor color, like optimization, uh, scheme for my monitor, which it apparently didn't actually need. So all I did was disable it and the blue tint went away, but it's like, why it did that? I don't know. Maybe it had something to do with the particular monitor I have. Uh, I am connected via HDMI, so that might have something to do with it. I don't know. I just had to disable the color the color scheme, and it went back to normal. So, But weird, weird all the same, because it didn't do it in Wayland, and it did do it in Xorg, and I'm not sure. Because I've never had, I've never, I think in all my years, I've never had a, a desktop decide that the color profile on my monitor was something other than what it was <laughs> and and do it automatically so yeah i would say it's been many years since that color palette or color configuration thing was like importantly exposed to a user <laughs> yeah it is definitely in the ubuntu 2204 settings it's right in the settings under color yeah but normally it's like i mean no one no one probably even knows what that is anymore i mean the last time you i remember having to actually load that on monitors is basically when we switched from <laughs> crts to lcd panels because right. uh yeah none of the operating systems could uh detect what the heck was going on with the monitors <laughs> yeah so so there's a fix for it it was really easy for me it's just one of those gotchas i don't know if anyone's even i didn't have to like google for or anything i kind of fixed it myself just by playing around but if that is an issue and other people have experienced it, well, you know, there, there's your solution. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that's, that's all I really had. Other than that, I guess we're, we're still trying to work on getting some uh, custom spins built up before we get to Hamvention. So we'll have stuff for people to copy. We will have the duplicator with us. So if you want a uh, Linux distribution to take home with you, just bring a USB stick and we'll get you one. And, uh, you know, there's all that. And if you forget to bring a USB stick, we'll have some for, Donation available. And I guess uh, that's all we have to say about that. So that's Fedora 36 and Ubuntu 22.04 and Pop OS 22.04 and lots of distros coming around. So anything else before I do a little preview? And I mean a little preview on Hamstack Hotline? Uh, No, no, can't think of anything more to add to that. All right. Very good. So I just, we we are going to do a deep dive on Hamstack Hotline. It's been around for a while. It's sort of recently come to my attention. And it's been interesting to play with. It's gotten me back into asterisk and PBXs and, and open source VOIP telephony and things like that. So I've been sort of wholeheartedly embracing it. Um, I've got a PBX set up for myself. I'm connected to the Hamshack Hotline network. And uh, it's been kind of interesting because I got into it right when they decided to do some major network changes. They actually do, they run several different networks one for the U.S., one for Europe, one for Asia Pacific. And then they have an experimental network that they use for people who want to bring sort of like unapproved telephony devices to the system, uh, people who want to, you know, live on the edge. Um, but two of those systems, the the Asia Pacific system and the uh, UX, what they call the UX system or the uh, experimental um, they, they started upgrading those to new machines and, and, you know, converting everything over to the new stuff. And in the process found that like everything was just borked from the ground up. So, so now both of those systems are completely offline and they're, you know, I guess they're working on getting it up. The whole, the whole thing is volunteer run. It's all based on open source hardware. And so it's, it's been taking a while to, to get those systems back in place. So a lot of people are offline right now because they were using them. But the two big systems, the EU system and the U.S. system, are both up. They they primarily support Cisco phones for hard phones, and they actually require you to have a hard phone before you can get a soft phone link, unless you do something like what I've done, which is set up a full PBX, and then other people can connect to your PBX. There's actually There's actually one 
ham, like KE8, I uh, forget what it was, LCW, something like that. That's probably wrong. Who's running a PBX, and he's he's hosting like 100 hams right now and connecting them to the Ham Shack hotline. And he can do that, like I can do that with uh, any soft phone or any hard phone. Uh, so, so those are connecting to the hotline through someone else's PBX, like a third party, which is the way I've got it set up. I also have a phone set up directly with the hotline, uh, cause I happen to have a Cisco SBA 508 lying around. So I did that as well. So I've got a couple of extensions in there, a full PBX. I've, I've leaked, I've got a, you know, full IVR and voicemail and, um, uh, all that kind of stuff set up and even linked my PBX to my all-star notes. So if you connect with the Hamshack hotline to my PBX, you can also link into my all-star nodes and they are bi-directional. So you can actually get on all-star using it. So that's kind of cool. So we're going to get into all of that in a, in a full deep dive, but I just wanted to say that I've been experimenting with it. It's, it's kind of fun. If you've got some spare hardware, telephony hardware, or even if you just want to go on eBay and spend 40 bucks and, you know, pick up a cheap handset or something like that. It's something we're going to talk about. It's really neat. Um, it, is, it is kind of a toy, but they're definitely trying to turn it into something um, more useful, I guess. I mean, it, it is still useful because you can do lots of things with it. Those RF bridges are nice. And just being able to direct dial um, other hams without using a commercial telephone network is pretty cool. And if you just like tinkering with things, it's it's a lot of fun. So, but we'll talk more about that in the future. I just wanted to to give kind of a preview of what's coming up. And if you wanted to get involved with Hamshack Hotline before we get to that, uh, definitely check out hamshackhotline.org. I think it's .org, either .org or .com, whatever. I think it's .org. <laughs> One or the other. Yeah, pretty sure it's .org. But uh, go there. the The docs are really good. The support staff is really good, and they also have a Discord server which we'll link to in the show notes. So check all that out because it will be an upcoming topic. And that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about it. And Bill's on my PBX. So <laughs> <laughs> I got him linked up and I got, I got an extension for Cheryl, but we, we haven't got a soft phone hooked up for her yet. So, but, and I am thinking about actually linking in a, a regular trunk into it. I, I can't find a, I can't find an actual SIP trunk provider for less than like 20 bucks a month. So I don't know that I actually want to go that route, but if I ever do, then you'll be able to link a regular phone to the Hamshack hotline and vice versa. So that'll be kind of cool too. Fancy. But yeah. Fancy. All right. Well, that's all I got. So on to the next, <laughs> which is announcements and feedback. And what do we got in announcements and feedback? Well, not much. <laughs> no, we, do, we, we actually do have some, with some feedback that I, that I somehow missed in the last episode. But the first thing we want to mention is of course, Hamvention, which is coming up in less than two weeks actually as of the time this gets released it's going to be almost down to one week so yeah 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 i'll be on the road yeah you'll <laughs> be on the road. one or the other <laughs> <laughs> no no not this week not actually. not this week it's the week after that yeah sorry yeah, not, not after the release of this episode after the release of the <laughs> next episode yeah it'll, be, yeah it'll be really close by then so uh anyway yeah bill bill will be driving <laughs> listening to the episode he just recorded <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly <laughs> so yeah we'll be in booth 5004 which of course is in building five and when you walk in through the front door we're about four tables back on the right so we hope to see everybody there it'll be a lot of fun we'll have some cool stuff there we'll have our new setup with all, all of our the way the new new digital booth is going to look with uh, with all the paper and banners and crap that we used to have to haul in there removed It'll be very sleek, very sexy. It'll be awesome. So we hope to see you there. And then, of course, after that, there will be the local ham fest here in southwest Missouri. That's in Springfield on June 4th from 8 to 1. And I will be setting up that same booth there, although probably with a little less uh, gadgetry. But it'll be basically the same. So if you don't get to see us in Hamvention and you happen to be in southwest Missouri, you can hit me up there. We'll be at the SMARC Hamfest or SMARC. So check that out. That's at smark.org. Of course, the link will be in the show notes. And do we have Cheryl here to read some feedback? Or has she gone AWOL? No, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to do some feedback? Sure. What the heck? Okay. 
Okay. So our piece of feedback is on episode number 464, and it is from Richard, KD5URB. And he says, please consider the dB ratio of the transmit signal to the receive signal. Before you continue, this is about the the two meter cans we were talking about for the repeater I'm setting up. And, uh, you know, we were talking about loss and like how to set up cans. Do we need cans? Can we deal with the, you know, the loss of signal, the attenuation and all that? So he's he's responding in kind with a with a learned answer. Yes. So he continues on to say a duplexer with four cans, two on receive, two on transmit, will offer 65 to 90 dB isolation between receive and transmit frequencies. That ratio is fixed once tuned, so increasing power output will decrease sensitivity of the repeater. Repeaters with poor isolation pulse on, then off, due to the transmit signal desensing the receiver on the repeater, so the system just pulses the transmitter on, then off, everything the input signal is acquired, then lost. This is very easy to demonstrate with a fusion repeater and a weak input signal like a portable transceiver. All right. Obviously, he meant fusion. (laughs) Yeah, I, I was looking at that going, I wonder if there's a typo there. Apparently there was. Yeah. So. Fustian. Fustian, the new, yes. uh, new Italian one. Fustian. Yeah, there you go. And as it happens, this will be a fusion repeater, so that's relevant. So thanks, Rich, KD5URB, or Richard, sorry, whichever you prefer. Uh, that's interesting information, so maybe it will spur me even more to go look for some cans at have mentioned see what's available out there you and bill can go go on a hunt <laughs> yeah maybe so it gives you looking a reason, for some cans yeah it gives you a reason to go out into the you know look at that the set of flea cans. market area yeah there you go <laughs> i think i think we're referring to a different set of cans oh well, what? <laughs> sorry <laughs> look at the cans on that all right <laughs> Uh, ham invention. That's going to be great. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It, it will be. Cheryl yeah, we're talking will, about them dog biscuits. Yeah. DB. Cheryl will officially be there to uh, herd Russ and Bill everywhere. I have a feeling. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, we do hope to see everybody at Ham Invention. But before we go ahead and wrap up the show, let's get on with our new subscribers, supporters, and live participants on the show tonight. And we'll let Cheryl sort of wrap us up. Alrighty then. So for this week, we did not have any new subscribers or Patreons, but we did have Jeff Spencer, Bill Bishop, Brian Heinrich, Anthony Stein, Ralph Stout, uh, Jim Young, Mark Pelodi, uh, Joshua McPhee, Josh Miscellane, Charles Groover, and Joe Roski, and Todd Edwards on Facebook. On Twitter, we had at Jason Fredden, at uh, Sweet Nisha R., and at Martin underscore Hines underscore. On YouTube, we had Chris B. and Craig Blado. On Discord, we had Jason Frieden. And on the live chat, we have Darren, VK6EK, Dan, KB6NU, and Mike, K6GTE. All right. So thanks, everybody, who listened to the show, joined us live. Tony said he was going to be here, but he must be out enjoying some sushi or booze or something interesting because because he said screw it to the show. So, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, he's he's been out having RC aircraft fun anyway. Boy, such a lucky man. <laughs> but that brings us down to the end of the show. So thanks everybody for listening. Thanks to everybody who downloads and listens every week. We appreciate it. We hope you will. Spread the word about the show if you can, and we also definitely appreciate our financial supporters. And regardless of how you know about Linux and the Ham Shack, we hope to see all of you at Hamvention in just a week and a half. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we definitely want to see you there. But with that, let's go ahead and wrap up the show. This has been episode number 466 of Linux and the Ham Shack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, ne 4 rd 73 Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Ham Shack. LHS is a community-sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page 
at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at 1-909-LHS-SHOW. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show-themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism.